Awesome. Thanks, Megan. I like that question. How are you recharging? That's a good one to think about on a middle of a Wednesday. Um, as Megan said, my name is Kira Waldman. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis, and I work primarily with Dr. Helen Dalka, but um, Sarah is also my co-advisor, so I'm excited to be introducing her here today. And um, yeah, so I'll give a quick bio and then pass it off to Sarah. And as Megan said, you can feel free to throw questions into the chat sort of throughout her talk. She's also welcome to be or, uh, interrupted throughout. So if you want to turn your mic on and share, or if you write them in the chat, then I will try and do um, so in a timely, timely way. And we'll also have plenty of time at the end. Um, but now to introduce. So we have Dr. Sarah Fakradine, who is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. And Dr. Fakradine's research focuses on understanding the geochemical and hydrological processes controlling water quality in managed aquifers. Prior to her current role, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Sustainable Water Resources Group at the University of Texas at Austin and served as a fellow in the Climate Resilient Water Systems Group at the Environmental Defense Fund. She received her PhD in Environmental Earth System Science and Master's in Science in Environmental Engineering and Science from Stanford University. So Sarah is a wonderful scientist and mentor and advisor and happy to be welcoming you for the first Blood Mar session um, of the year. So I'll pass it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Kira. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, great, does that look all right? Cool, Looks and you great. can hear me all right? Perfect. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for the introduction and, and for having me. Um, I'm very excited to be virtually back in California, where I, I worked a lot in, in grad school as well as with EDF. Um, and now I'm over in, in wetter climates in Pittsburgh. Um, so it's nice to, to virtually be thinking about California. Um, so uh, as you all mentioned, I'll, I'll be talking about ways that we can understand and minimize arsenic mobilization during managed aquifer recharge. And a lot of my work has focused more on traditional types of managed aquifer recharge, like spreading basins and injection sites. But I will try as I'm going through today to relate it back to flood mar and applications to agricultural land. And as Kira said, feel free to, to interrupt um, or to, to throw in a question as I'm going. Um, so first I'll quickly just um, talk more broadly about arsenic, about geochemistry, why we worry about it during managed aquifer recharge. And then I'll give some specific case studies of work we did with Orange County Water District in California. And then finally, I'll zoom out and talk about some um, guidance we've been working on putting together related to how to manage uh, naturally occurring contaminants in, in these systems. So starting first with a bit of background, uh, as we see more and more managed aquifer recharge sites popping up and in different, different ways, different types of operations, we see more and more sites re reporting um, arsenic mobilization during their recharge operations. And this occurs in a number of different settings, both infiltration-based settings, injection-based settings. Um, these sites are widely distributed, so it's also different geochemical conditions in these aquifers and different types of source water. So whether that's flood water, storm water, recycled wastewater, there are a number of different site-specific conditions that can occur at these sites. Um, and in most of these sites uh, that we see arsenic mobilization, we're recharging clean water into a clean aquifer. And then when we go to recover that water, we see um, we see arsenic and potentially other naturally occurring contaminants. So um, in these cases, uh, these contaminants pose a particular challenge because they are ubiquitous to soils and sediments globally. So um, earth sediments are naturally abundant in metals and metalloids like arsenic, chromium, uranium, and manganese. And depending on how the geochemical conditions are perturbed or how they evolve at a recharge site, we can potentially mobilize these contaminants from soils and sediments and into the surrounding groundwater. So um, one thing I'll, I'll highlight is that um, the geochemical conditions, again, are really what dictates whether or not we see arsenic in, in water. 
Uh, soil concentrations are not a good proxy or indicator of potential arsenic mobilization. So on the left here, you see, um, and these are both figures from USGS studies, but on the left is arsenic concentrations in soils. And on the right is modeled concentrations of what you might expect in groundwater. And I'll just highlight that there's places in the US where we have high concentrations in the soils, but you don't see arsenic in the groundwater uh, because the geochemical conditions are not ones that cause mobilization. They favor arsenic staying on the solids. And vice versa, there's places where you have pretty low arsenic concentrations in soils and sediments, but you do see high concentrations potentially in groundwater, potentially concentrations exceeding the drinking water limit. And again, that comes back to how the geochemistry is evolving under really site-specific um, conditions. So that's why this is a challenge specifically for managed aquifer recharge, because we know that when we take some external source of water and artificially recharge those aquifers, we can trigger a number of different geochemical shifts that could occur. Some of the main ones that we focus on, um, so here on the right, you see um, redox shifts. So many of these, these metals and metalloids like arsenic are redox active. So depending on the presence of oxygen or other oxidants, they could be mobile or immobile. Um, there's also a number of, in the middle, um, desorption processes, so um, competitive processes that can knock off arsenic from the surface of, of a soil or sediment particle and into water, as well as a number of, on the left, um, precipitation and dis dissolution reactions that can occur. So if we are dissolving things like calcium carbonate, releasing um, uh, dissolved species into the water, changing the pH um, subsequently, that can have an impact on how, how these toxic contaminants are retained or mobilized. And I'll, I'll step through these um, a little more carefully because uh, they'll come in when we, we talk about processes occurring at sites. But generally in a system that is oxic, like an infiltration basin that's well aerated uh, or like agricultural soils, we often expect arsenic to be in its oxidized form, which is arsenic-5, arsenate, and that absorbs really strongly to iron oxides, essentially rust particles. Um, and you don't expect to see it in the water. It should be absorbed really strongly to these, um, these solids, these aquifer minerals, unless you have um, these three typical causal mechanisms of release. So a shift in redox condition, an increase in pH or competing ions. Um, shifts in redox conditions can cause uh, what we call reductive dissolution of the iron oxide. So you can dissolve the host mineral, which releases arsenic. You can also um, um, reduce the arsenic to its more mobile form, arsenic-3 or arsenite, which again will mobilize it to groundwater. Increases in pH change the, the surface charge of these particles. So around pH is above eight, eight and a half is when we start to run into issues with arsenic release from iron oxides. And then uh, finally competing ions. So as an example, phosphate is a really great analog for arsenate. It has a very similar structure. Um, so it will compete for sorption sites. If a lot of phosphate comes into the system, uh, it'll knock off arsenate and release it into, into the groundwater. So generally, those are the three conditions um, we typically want to avoid and, and things we would look out for at a recharge site to help ensure that arsenic is not being mobilized. And I'll just quickly put this into the context of blood mar geochemistry. So this is work from um, Lev and Paul et al., so Helen Dalka's group at UC Davis, um, where Kira is, uh, but they uh, did a really nice job capturing how flood events can impact redox chemistry. So in that top plot is just soil moisture and it goes up when you have a flooding event, um, but the bottom two plots are really capturing how the redox is changing. So you're depleting the oxygen during a flood, flood cycle um, in that middle plot, and that's causing a shift in ORP potentially to reducing conditions. And again, that shift in redox is one that is a potential concern when thinking about redox active elements like arsenic. So um, one of the interesting things potentially about flood mar sites and 
here has been been working on this at, at field sites, but that you start oscillating when you have um, oxic conditions, the, that arsenic is immobilized on the iron oxides. And then during flood events, you you can potentially have um, these mobili mobilizing conditions. So you could start oscillating back and forth between flood periods and um, not flood periods. So um, things to consider are, again, shifts in redox chemistry, like you would see during a flood event, and can you maintain oxic or aerated conditions to prevent that shift, as well as increases in pH. So alkaline soils, as an example, could be um, one to, to consider more seriously for uh, potential arsenic mobilization, and then competing ions. So as I said, phosphate is, is a particular analog, so considering you know, when was the most recent phosphate application on a field, for example, and how might you want to time that um, uh, to avoid uh, phosphate displacing arsenate. So that's kind of the background on, on geochemistry. I can pause a little bit if there's questions or keep going to uh, talk a little bit more about specific a specific study example. I'll Those keep going. Questions. Yes. Okay. Let's carry on. Sounds good. All right. Um, so uh, when I was uh, a PhD student, we uh, had the opportunity to collaborate with Orange County Water District on their, their groundwater replenishment system, which um, is uh, the case studies that I'll, I'll show today. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with Orange County. Um, massive indirect potable reuse project uh, taking treated wastewater. And I'll highlight that this is, of course, geochemically very different than a flood mar site where you're taking flood water. Here um, you have highly treated, purified, low ionic strength water. Uh, but one of the very cool things about Orange County is that they do both infiltration and injection. So that lets us study two very different systems. The infiltration basins are these shallow aerated systems. And then the injection site is one where we expect to see shifting redox conditions. So if you're injecting oxic water into a deep aquifer that previously has not had um, exposure to dissolved oxygen. Um, I'm going to just quickly mention the infiltration sites because they're they're less relevant for flood mar. Um, and that's because the mechanisms that we we found were causing arsenic mobilization in the infiltration area is really related to the high purity nature of the recharge water. So um, you have clays in the in the sediments, and clays are negatively charged. Uh, prior to recharge, calcium and magnesium, which are these divalent cations, form these really effective cation bridging complexes to arsenate oxyanions, which are negatively charged. So initially, before recharge, arsenic is bound to these clay surfaces through these cation bridging complexes. When that high purity water comes in, it starts stripping the aquifer solids of calcium and magnesium, and that releases arsenic to the, to the surrounding pore water. Um, so this is more a mechanism that is fairly unique to high purity environments. But the point I'll make here is just that if, if we understand these processes, we can start to think about ways to design strategies to mitigate arsenic release. And in this case, it's a question of can you leverage the drinking water treatment plant to add back cations and um, like calcium and magnesium so that you, you keep that, um, that complex, that cation bridging um, and keep arsenic on the solids. But um, so that's just a quick aside about the infiltration basins. Where I'll talk more is about um, the injection site since that represents a shifting redox environment like we see um, uh, in that data that I showed from, from Helen's group where you see that change in redox condition. So just to help orient a little bit, this is a schematic of the injection site it's a continuous injection well, and it recharges several different strata in the basin. So it's injecting into multiple different units in one well. And there's data from <clears throat> down gradient monitoring sites. Uh, one is about 30 meters away and the other is about 200 meters away. 
and again, here, um, here we're more interested um, or more, more focused on potential shifts that could occur with respect to redox. So initially we expect arsenic to be bound in these pyritic minerals or pool gold, iron sulfide, um, arsenopyrite. When you introduce oxidants like oxygen to that system, you oxidize those pyritic minerals and that releases iron, which then precipitates out again as iron oxides. We also release arsenic and that arsenic bounds to iron oxides. So in some sense, this is a self-correcting problem. Arsenic is going from one solid to another solid, and we wouldn't expect to see it in the, the water unless, again, you have one of these three shifts again. So if the redox shifts back to reducing conditions, if you have that oscillation between oxic and reducing conditions, you can mobilize arsenic. Um, if the pH, again, increases above about eight, eight and a half, or if you have competing ions in, in the water, you'll mobilize the arsenic. So um, this was a mix of field work, experimental work, as well as modeling work. But part of this was um, getting drill cuttings to look at a potential associations of arsenic with other elements. Um, so here it's showing arsenic, iron, sulfur, and pyrite with depth. And you can see that arsenic is um, found or uh, co-located often with pyritic minerals um, and other redox active minerals. And uh, we combine the, the solid data with the aqueous data, uh, with the, the monitoring well data to put this into reactive transport models. So um, really simulating the chemistry and the reaction network to try to understand what processes are occurring at different depths in the aquifer. So this is just um, chloride as an example of, of the modeling work, but where you have these yellow bubbles, um, that is low chloride concentrations, and that's associated with the storage of the high purity water. So you can see those storage bubbles at, at depths. And we just use chloride as, as a tracer, an intrinsic tracer, since um, the recharge water doesn't have uh, or has pretty low chloride compared to background concentration. Um, but what I'll talk more about is uh, the arsenic trends that we see. So this is, um, these are, the black dots are data observed from different depths in the well. And um, the blue line is, is modeling results. The green line is we just do a test. Um, if the aquifer was not reactive, what would we expect to see? Um, and then the blue line is when we add reactions to try to understand what those processes are. So in that, and the red line is when injection starts. So in this top plot, um, we see that there's we have a low background concentration of arsenic, about two micrograms per liter. Injection starts, so we start introducing the, the oxic water and arsenic concentrations go up a few ppb, um, a few micrograms per liter, and then kind of stabilize. And that is coming from um, oxidation of arsenopyrite minerals. If there were no reactions in the system, you would just expect to flush out arsenic, um, which is what you see in the green line. And then at other depths, we see a, kind of a small little, like, few PPV release of arsenic and then concentrations drop back down. Um, but what the, the modeling allows us to do is really hone in on which processes are occurring at which depths. And in particular here, the environment is has mixed um, initial redox conditions. So there's portions of the aquifer that have had prior exposure to oxygen and others that arsenic is found in these sulfitic minerals. Um, but in general, what we see, regardless of the starting state of arsenic in this system is that that high purity water is um, causing the pH to increase to above or around eight and a half in this case, and that's limiting the absorption of arsenic on these iron oxides. So in this system, you have both processes occurring, a change in redox as well as a change in, in pH. Um, but this is just to provide a sense of the site site specificity of some of these processes and, and how we look for different triggers in these systems. And what I wanna highlight from the case studies is that, again, you can have these different processes occurring, some of which can occur simultaneously, 
but that you can try to develop targeted approaches to prevent adverse geochemical conditions at different sites. So for example, if, if it is a shift in redox that is causing arsenic release, can you um, avoid anoxic conditions? Can you time flooding cycles, for example, in a way that prevents, um, prevents uh, reducing or anoxia, anoxic conditions? Um, and as well, you know, it's often very difficult to monitor things like arsenic and other metals. It requires a lab to do that at, at low concentrations. So can you use um, low cost approaches like monitoring oxygen, ORP or pH to try to predict or, or capture when conditions might shift in a way that, um, that is potentially uh, a concern for metals? So you know, using some of the things we, we gathered from specific case studies, we have been integrating that into different uh, guidance documents, which are publicly available. And I will talk about a couple of those. So on the left is a guidance document we developed for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. As some background, Texas has recently reformed some of its permitting structures to really facilitate the adoption of aquifer storage and recovery, so specifically injection and, and recovery from the same well. Um, and part of that has led to potential concerns about what that might mean for water quality. So this was a, a, um, a project that was funded by the state to develop some official guidance around uh, considerations for minimizing arsenic mobilization. Um, and it uh, contains a few resources that, while it's focused on ASR, are broadly applicable to MAR projects, um, and I'll show some of that. But on the right is also a guidance document um, we did with the Environmental Defense Fund um, with a number of, of co-authors at, at Stanford and Berkeley and the Green Science Policy Institute uh, after, or more focused on integrating natural contaminants like arsenic, uh, uranium, into um, sigma implementation. So broadly thinking about water management and how naturally occurring contaminants um, can factor into that. So some of the things that are included in, in these documents are, for example, um, sort of look up tables of um, different contaminants of concern, different naturally occurring contaminants, and the conditions where we we start to worry about them. So is it under high oxygen conditions, high pH, low pH? What are the conditions you want to avoid? Again, coming back to the idea that not a lot of people are, are able to have um, very frequent monitoring of metals like arsenic. Um, but if you can monitor with um, in situ or, or field sampling things like oxygen and pH, you can potentially capture conditions and, and understand when conditions are, are shifting and when you might want to go in and sample for metals. Um, so this is from the Texas document on ASR, but we also synthesize this geochemical information into flowcharts or decision trees to um, assess potential risk of arsenic release. And this is in the context of injection, so you could have an anoxic aquifer. In a flood mar system, I would expect your soils are oxic. It's an aerated um, beta zone environment. So the rest, the right side of, of this flow chart is, is really where you would be operating in terms of understanding. Um, so for instance, in that, that second part, um, do redox conditions shift? Does it remain oxic? Is the pH increasing above eight? Are there sources of, of competing ions and using that to figure out potentially if um, you have a high risk or a low risk of, of arsenic release. Um, so in that way, we were trying to make, make this information a bit more accessible um, for new projects or project planning. And then um, the last thing I'll talk about from, from the guidance document is since so, so much of this issue of geochemical compatibility really is site-specific. It depends on your ambient aquifer conditions and 
how you are recharging water and the, the type of water you are recharging. Um, a lot of it was focused around how to develop a site-specific conceptual model. So what are the things or analyses you can measure um, prior to uh, planning a project or in the planning phases, um, both on the aquifer side as well as the in, uh, infiltration or injection water side, and then using um, some of the tools to assess which potential processes are most of concern and what, how that translates again to risks, uh, potential risk for arsenic mobilization or low risk and um, guidance on developing water quality monitoring programs, as well as how to update that information as you develop, um, how to update that conceptual model as you gather more information. So um, I will summarize there, but um, essentially a, a, a lot of um, the focus uh, through these site-specific studies, as well as through some of the broader uh, outreach efforts has been to highlight that natural contaminants, geogenic contaminants can pose a unique challenge. Um, again, because they are ubiquitous globally in soils and sediments. And um, a lot of that challenge comes to the need to really understand geochemical compatibility of the source water and the receiving aquifer. Um, but that there are resources um, to understand these processes better, and that includes both guidance on, on monitoring as well as on some of the, the operations pieces. So I will stop there, um, but uh, happy to, to discuss more, and a big thank you to collaborators in, in Orange County as well as in um, TCEQ and the, the Water Development Board in Texas. And also that is my email in case the anyone have questions via email. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. That was awesome. Lots of engaging work in there. I mean, you went from like nitty gritty geochemistry to these large, very application and project based analysis. So that was really cool to see. Um, a couple questions, if we're ready to get started, have come into the chat. I think the first maybe is just a softball yes or no question, but um, well, those documents, I think we're referring to the guidance plans um, that you came up with at the end, are those gonna be shared or are those publicly accessible for folks to um, take a look at? Yes, both are publicly available. Um, maybe I can email them to you, Megan, and you can share them somehow. Um, but yes, they are both publicly available through Texas Commission on Environmental Quality's website and um, Environmental Defense Fund's website for the California one. And the California one is, um, I didn't talk about it here, but it, it focuses on California, of course, but has some geologic maps of the state as well as background concentrations for different, um, different geogenic contaminants like selenium, chromium, uranium. So I think one of, one of the helpful things there is just providing some context for what these concentrations typically look like in, in a lot of natural systems in the state. Cool. That actually what you just said at the end there in terms of like background concentrations sort of goes to this question that just came in, um, which is asking essentially when there are high concentrations of arsenic that are already detected in local drinking water, does Floodmar have any potential to dilute the existing arsenic levels or do you need a more in-depth geochemical assessment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually in the EDF, the California document, one of the, the things that we um, mentioned in there or highlighted was that you know, there are cases where MAR can improve water quality and cases where it can degrade water quality. It is a really qu a question of the geochemical compatibility piece. But, you know, if you're going into an aquifer that initially has no arsenic, then of course your concern is potentially degrading water quality. But to that, you know, I, it's an excellent point that when you have aquifers where you potentially have background concentrations or existing degraded water quality, MAR can absolutely provide an opportunity to improve water quality. Um, but there are also trade-offs between different contaminants. So thinking about the water quality in that aquifer more holistically. So 
I I would look at not just arsenic, but of course overall water quality to see if you know if in trying to address one contaminant, you know, are making sure you're not creating geochemical conditions that might not be favorable for another. But um, certainly just through through flushing processes with clean water, assuming you're maintaining oxic conditions, not introducing other contaminants, it, it can be an opportunity to improve impaired sources. Awesome. Yeah, that's exactly sort of getting to another question that just came in. And I was even thinking back to your table where the blue and the red arrows are almost opposite <laughs> um, in terms yeah. of to the different contaminants. So yeah, how do you manage for that? And there's a question here from... Um, that that's asking so yeah if referring to the same table showing the factors that influence the mobility of other contaminants during mar and specifically has ocwd been seen mobilization of any other contaminants such as uranium or chromium etc as a result of these ph and redox shifts from injection wells so yeah sort of talking maybe about the trade-offs between geogenic contaminants um from a geochemical perspective sure yeah um so to answer the the second question um we looked at, um, so they had, so we looked at chromium data, um, uranium as a um, uh, vanadium data, and then uranium through um, uh, not direct dissolved measurements of uranium, but through different um, proxy measurements and never saw for, for Orange County chromium or uranium. There was a small peak in vanadium, but it, it went away quickly and we weren't sure why that is, but probably something in, in the redox chemistry. We didn't focus on it since it kind of appeared and then went went away rather quickly. So in the case of Orange County, it, it was a slightly more straightforward system in the sense that arsenic was the one they were worrying about and we didn't see others that, that presented a potential issue. Um, broadly speaking, this question of, of trade-offs um, in water quality, I, I think, is a really challenging one. And in the guidance documents, what we highlighted is, you know, it, it really comes down to thinking about um, what that water will be used for. So apart from the regulatory piece, thinking about designing these water management strategies so they really are uh, fit for purpose. So we see cases where, for example, um, you know, if you if you go towards reducing conditions, you can remove nitrate from water, but then you are also mobilizing manganese. So, uh, so you know, there are specific sites that have had to make this decision about what what is more acceptable for them. Is it the manganese or is it the nitrate? And if that water is going to be used for agricultural purposes, maybe a bit of nitrate is okay relative to manganese kind of clogging up pipes and um, causing other issues like biofouling. So you, what we what we laid out in, in the paper uh, in the guidance document is you know manage for, for what your biggest problem is and consider holistically how that water is going to be used so what what the biggest threats are for the application. So having a fit fit for purpose approach. Cool. I guess I would ask a follow-up question there. Like, can you also just look at the background levels in, in those areas to just make any assumptions about what might get worse or better based off of what already exists in the sort of chemical assessment? Yeah, it's it's a challenge because um, you know, looking only at the, the background piece will tell you, it'll give you some information on the existing geochemical conditions, but especially in the case of, of MAR, um, you really need to, to project or think about how that condition is going to evolve. So if the water that you're introducing is very different in co composition, or if it's going to trigger some processes, um, then it, it, it's not going to be enough to just look at um, the background concentration. And that comes up a lot when when we talk to folks about um, dissolved organic carbon as an example, so you know it's a nutrient. It's it's not seen as a contaminant directly, but it can um, you know microbes will get 
you know, invigorated by this DOC, consume a lot of oxygen, so it can cause these redox shifts that then could potentially pose a, a problem for arsenic. So you could look at a background water and say, oh, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a problem here and, and look at a surface water and that you're recharging and say, okay, just pass a little bit of DOC, it's potentially not a problem, but but thinking more about how, how those interactions might occur. So that's a very long-winded answer for <laughs> For your question, um, but yeah, it, it requires assessing assessing really both and and thinking about the shifts that could occur, which is what we tried to capture with with the flow chart. Cool. Yeah. So kind of I guess then going from the maybe monitoring to modeling, um, and maybe without having data, there's a question here that asks: Is there are any modeling or is there any modeling of the fate and mobilized arsenic as they move away from areas with perturbed pH EH conditions? And do we actually see attenuation or remineralization with distance from recharge location? So thinking about how the soil or legacy of these projects can leave. Yeah, yeah. So specifically in the case of, um, I can I can speak to Orange County since we've seen that data, but where there are down gradient wells further away, you, you do see attenuation. So you can resorb that arsenic on solids as it's migrating um, away from, from the recharge site. Uh, I think the challenge there is, again, it, it depends on where you are going to recover that water. So of course, each site will have its own um, flow dynamics. In the case of aquifer storage and recovery, which is what's being used in Texas, you're injecting and recovering from the same well. So down gradient attenuation is it's kind of just on the periphery of your storage zone. It's, it's not related to where you are. In the case of flood mar, I, I think it comes down to where you are um, injecting or, or uh, sorry, where you're infiltrating and then where you're extracting and, and what the geochemistry is in those systems. So, you know, I, it depends. It's not, oh, it's not my favorite answer to give, but, <laughs> but it does depend. Um, and I think, you know, maybe some of, um, uh, Helen's work, as well as others at, at some of the UCs um, have monitored this, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, there definitely, I have seen modeling studies in general, trying to capture the, the transport from Thomas Harder's group, um, uh, Kate Maher's group as well. Well, I, I don't know if it's specific to, I've seen that more, I should say, in, in the case of nitrate and, and other things. Um, uh, but yeah. So we just need more people working on the modeling of the component, maybe. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, no, so Veronica, yeah, just put in a question here, sort of similarly thinking about the impact of these projects. She's asking um, if you have any insights on the duration of the bad conditions that lead to arsenic mobilization during flood mar or ASR. Presumably after some period of time after MAR operations, the aquifer world will return to its natural conditions when arsenic was not mobile. So in other words, is the mobilization of arsenic a permanent change that impairs groundwater quality, or is this just a temporary problem? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and for that, we would love if someone would be willing to gather really long-term data. Um, we So we do see um, exactly what Veronica is saying at some um, I'll use some ASR sites as an example. You know, they go through their first few cycles where they have these big shifts in redox chemistry, shifts back and forth, and they see pretty big pulses of arsenic. And then over time, as they keep operating, um, that peak concentration is declining over time. And what that tells us is that there is a labile source of arsenic that is getting depleted. The challenge is some of those sites, um, they, they stopped operating for a few years, and then they went back and, and restarted operating them. And so I think one site, for example, took a five-year break, and, and this was at a, a recharge site in Florida, and then they started recharging again. And they they once they started recharging again, they went back and, and saw in those initial cycles a um, peak in arsenic again when they restarted operations. So you can, the impact of arsenic will um, change over time, but that is contingent on 
how you operate those sites over time. So if, for example, there is a big shift, like if you change your source water chemistry, um, you know, halfway through a project or something like that. And, and some sites talk about that. They talk about having two different types of source water that they can choose between. Um, so part of it is really considering are your operating conditions going to change? And is that going to then cause a, a shift um, or a shift and then a subsequent shift when you change conditions? Um, but in terms of, you know, a specific time frame for when when you start attenuating. Um, I don't think I maybe I have it here. So th this is an example from our from the infiltration basins in Orange County. Um, and this is again not directly related to flood Mars since it's high purity water, but on the left you have chloride concentrations in light blue, which we use again as a tracer, and the dark blue is, is arsenic concentrations. And this is a bit messy. So essentially what you're seeing is, again, when these chloride concentrations drop, that's a recharge cycle. So they get you know pretty good attenuation by the, the third cycle and concentrations are going down. Um, so I mean, using this anecdotally as one specific site that was over the course of, of two, two years or so. But it really just, I would say, it comes down to how you are operating those sites. Are you operating them consistently? Um, if you are going to have a big change in operations, I, I would consider that potentially like a, a reset or another shift that needs to be analyzed again. I guess just because there's time. So on the three recharge kind of regime regimes, are you... Considering it's an injection well, is it the injection water all going to the same place in each of those? And are you pumping out from the same depth as well? So this is actually Orange County's infiltration basin. Okay. Um, so on the left is kind of a map. This wasn't the injection site. Um, and this is data from a monitoring well down gradient. So this is where the cation bridging infiltration. So this one's not injection. Um, and they... Um, at the time, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but the water is required, I think it was by California, um, don't quote me, but I think it was um, the Department of Public Health with advanced treated wastewater to stay in the aquifer for a residence time of about six months. So they don't they don't extract that water you know, very close to the infiltration basins. It's um, at a six month buffer period okay. outside of that. Cool. And then it's then it's pumped back up. Uh, speaking of buffer, <laughs> there's a question here, um, maybe less of a temporal, more of a spatial buffer, but um, someone's asking that if arsenic is detected in the groundwater, is there a buffer area you would recommend exercise caution within when it comes to flood mar? Or in other words, are the conditions that produce the arsenic in groundwater in one community likely to be similar for a neighboring community with a, within a certain distance? Yeah, it's it's a challenge to create a general, um, you know, buffer zone criteria because there is so much heterogeneity, especially in um, uh, the hydrogeology of these systems. I think California as a state has done really well developing groundwater models and and you know having a high level understanding of of the flow and and some of the um, major aquifers. So you know to the extent that you can get data from that. I would say looking at those those regional models or regional modeling studies to try to assess um, what a buffer, what a good buffer distance should be. Um, I know in the case of advanced treated wastewater, there are specific regulations to that. But in a case like Floodmar, um, one of the things we mentioned in the guidance document is, um, and a lot of utilities do this, but planning your buffer distance so that it gives you enough time to respond if there is a if there is an issue. So um, if you have you know a buffer zone of a certain length that corresponds to say three weeks arrival time or four weeks, I'm just throwing out numbers. Um, but something that would give a, a water manager 
um, or a community time to um, try to address that or you know, think about contingency plans for, for other sources of water. So um, that that is oftentimes how those buffers might be conceptualized in, in terms of response time. Awesome, we probably have time for about one more question if anyone wants to either speak up or put it in the chat. Oh, here, we got one. Um, flood mar typically occurs every three to five years in our area. How does this factor into a model situation? Oh, That's good question. question. Yeah. Um, so occurs three to five, every three to five years, just based on the availability of high flows. Is that, I'm guessing, but within a specific high flow period. So within a specific year, there might be multiple flood events. Does that? Mark, if you wanted to unmute yourself and add a little context, you're more than welcome. He might be specifically referring to um, flooding their fields. Or... Hi. Yeah, typically Hello. we get um, flood flows maybe February, March, April. Um, last year was quite a long time, but usually it's a three month period and it's every three to five years. And so I just wondered in the modeling if that's considered. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for the work that, that we did, we um, did not, you know, it was very system, very different system um, focused on the injection data. So we did not model model that. Um, I don't know if there are others on the call that have been involved in modeling efforts that um, have looked at more long-term impacts of this kind of temporal dynamics of every few years or so. But um, to, to my knowledge, I, I, I don't have anything off the top of my head. But it is a, it is a very good question. Okay, well, that sums up all the questions that came into the chat. I'll scroll to see if I missed any. Um, but maybe, yeah, just a request to post some of those links um, and documents when they become available or when they're available. And yeah, a lot of appreciation and great talk, Sarah. Thanks for kicking it off. And yeah, thank you so much. I guess. Um, that might wrap us up, Megan. I'm not sure what I'm missing here, but. Sounds great. I think I might have found the link on the EDF website and shared it in the chat, but Sarah can send me the documents and I can get those distributed to our listserv here and give us a couple of days, probably early next week, we'll have the recording from Sarah's presentation posted to our floodmar.org website. So thanks everyone for making the time to join us today. Thank you, Sarah, for your talk. We're glad to have you. And thanks. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. Thanks, Megan. Plug, if you're at Bismar, you can come to my poster that Sarah's a co-advisor on, which is a different scale, but a lot of the same questions. Yeah. And that is very specifically Floodmar. So stay yeah. tuned for Kira's work. <laughs> Excellent. Kira, we'll have you up next. Uh, yeah. Give me like 10 years, but yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll put you on the back burner. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.